Merry Christmas, church. I remind people when you're shopping, when you're downtown, and if they say happy holiday or something like that, I said, no, it's not. It's Merry Christmas. I appreciate it if you tell me that. And some of them sort of look blind at you, but, uh, you know, I'm going to let them know who I am. I, like I told you, I used to be backwards. You know, I, I lost him. I buried him somewhere out there. He no longer. And I noticed that the men did, they did good up here, huh? Yeah. You know, if, we got we to we do one thing, though. We got to tell them to turn their voice up. It's all right. We can, you know, turn it up. Don't, you know, but I know what it's like to be up here for the first time. You're nervous. Your voice is, you know, shaky. You're shaky. And uh, that's the way you make it, though. I begged my pastor to quit doing that to me because he didn't want to put me in front of people. He knew what was up in my life. I didn't. And he would push me in front of the people, and I said, I don't want up there. He said, that's where God's pushing you. It's none of my business. I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. All right. Let me talk to you for a few minutes about what God is saying to the church, where we're headed, and what's going to be taking place. But one thing you're going to have to, you've got to have to get rid of, you're going to have to get rid of the Old Testament law out of your life. You've got to come over into the New Testament. The Old Testament law says what you did is how, how you can serve, how the better you did, the more you serve God. But the New Testament, Jesus did all for us. We don't have to, you know, he did it all. He paid the whole price. Let me go to... Uh, let me make sure I get the right one. 1 Corinthians 15.56. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 15.56. The sting of death is sin. Because yeah. the Bible does say when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. So the sting of it is sin. Now look at here. The strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin. In other words, man did not know sin. Sin until the law came in. The law was so perfect, the men couldn't live by it. It was a perfect, perfect. Totally. But men couldn't live by the law. The law says, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Or do this, do this, do this. That was the law. But when Jesus came in, he didn't do away with it. He superseded it. You understand that? He gave you something greater. Something greater. Now let me let me let me give you one more. I'm t- Matthew twenty two, thirty six to forty. Here is what was brought in over over the Ten Commandments. You can go into you can go into Leviticus and go to Deuteronomy. It'll it'll show you there the Ten Commandments. And here is a lawyer that came to Jesus. He said, Master, or what Master means, teacher, teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the greatest? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with how much of your heart? All of it. How much of your heart? All of it. And with all your soul and with all thy mind. Keep going. This is the first great commandment. And the second is like this. Here's what it's like. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy self. That's true. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy self. Thou shalt love. But see, the first one is to love God. Yes. To love Him. Yep. So loving Him, what it did, on this commandment hangs all the commandments of the law. Hangs everything. Is it the next one? See, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What it means... Everything that was spoken in the Old Covenant now hangs underneath these two. It's like, you know, a few years ago, my wife says, I need a clothes hanger right outside the door where I'm doing the washing and the drying. I need them right here where I can take my clothes out of here and hang them up. How come you just don't hang them up midair? Just lay them out on the ground. It's good enough for me. You know, just lay them out. It don't work. She needs something to hang on from. 
But, you know, I told her, I said, well, that's easy for you to say because there was nothing out there but concrete, four inches deep, concrete. How are you going to hang a pole on concrete? Just a pole. Boom. So what I did is I took my mallet and began to hit one spot. I marked the spot and began to hit it. Five-pound mallet, boom, and hit it, and I hit it, and I hit it. And with about five minutes, all of a sudden, it began to break up because it hit the same spot. Because, see, the Bible says if you take a hammer and hit the rock, if you keep hitting it, pretty soon you're going to break something up. Concrete is a rock. And so I figured, you know, sooner or later, this guy's got to give in. Kept hitting the same spot. And all of a sudden, it began to crack. So I kept hitting it, kept hitting it, until it literally really just broke the whole thing up. And I got it out of the way, put the pole there. Now she has something to hang her clothes from. Lines. Jesus, see, the, the, the old covenant, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou, and it kept going, thou shalt not. And you still, you can't do that. I know that. But something greater came in there. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Okay, that's the first one, number one. So if I love God, all of these other things will just be washed away. I fulfilled every one of them. In other words, these two hang up on top, and then he put the other ten underneath it. They're there hanging, but these two are greater. So if I did these two, then the, what is hanging from them, I'll never need them. But, but I've noticed the church is living by that, thou shalt not. Thou shalt. We judge our, we judge our walk by what we do, what we say. Trevor said it, you know, we, we really, God is who we created in our, in our mind, not the creator, but who created me. Now, what, he, what, he, what has he done for the church? You ever ask yourself, what has he done for the church? Did he die? Did he take the stripes on his back? Did he take the sword in his side? Did he take the thorns on his head? Did he take the nails in his hands and feet? But the greatest thing of all this thing, see, everything that was done to the body, now notice, everything that was done to the body now can be your, your reward for your body. It's your reward. They said he beat him. The stripes was for your healing. The church, when they put the, the spear in the side, out come water and blood. When it came out, that was the church being born. It came out of his side. Then when they, put the, when they put the thorns on his head, and when they pushed them down to the point that when blood began to drip, in other words, the curse went in his brow and out dripped your prosperity. When the blood's dripped, it's your prosperity. If you begin to study all the places where the blood was, came from his body, you'll find out all those things was for me. It was for you. But then before, he would, before it could be all finished, because he paid for the body to make sure it was going to be healthy, going to be whole, it could be prosperous. And the last thing he paid for was your spirit. Because the body couldn't pay for your spirit. Where was the body when the spirit went to hell? Where was the body? He dropped it off, didn't he? He dropped the body off. They took it and put it, put it in a grave, right? Yes. They rolled the stones out of the way. They put the body in there, put a stone back in there. That's where his body stayed. But there was more payment to be made. That was for your sins to be rolled away. Yes. He said, once you, once, once you come to God and you have asked God to forgive you of your sins, he said, I will never bring those up again because I will throw them as far as the east is from the west, never to remember them again against you. Now, where did, where did this come from? Well, that's, that's Isaiah 53.10. Here's where the Father stepped in. Father did this, not man. The Father said, the Father beat him. What did he beat him with? My sins, your sins. So he said, please the Lord to bruise him. That word bruise means to beat. Bruise him with our sins. Actually, think about it. 
every sin that was ever committed in this earth prior to his death in, in all the years he was here and after, his, after it, even up till today, every sin that was ever to be committed by man was forgiven. But if there's one thing that has to be done, I have to ask him to do it. I have to ask him. I have to ask him. See, a lot of people, listen, listen, listen. I didn't mean to go here this much, but I keep hearing God say, a lot of people are not, see, you don't develop your faith to receive from God. When, a lot of times when you come up here for me to pray for you or wherever somebody pray for you, you're wanting them to use their faith yes. to get you what you want. Yep. That don't work. Yep. That don't work. Maybe, let me put it this way, when you're a baby Christian, I can carry you on my faith, but I can't carry you once you get your diapers off. Can't carry no more. Can't do it. Why? You have to walk on your own. You have to, you have to, once you sit under the, under the anointed word and hear it, yes. God, God requires you to grow up. Yes. You now have to do some things with your faith. Yes. You have to, to develop your faith. Mm-hmm. And as you develop your faith, now your faith can do the same thing as his faith. Yes. Am I losing you? If he gave, but I, you know, I looked at it this way. If he gave me his faith, so, I've, so I look back in the, in, the New, in the New Testament and found out what his faith did. And so he took what he used on this earth and gave it to me. So what he used, give it to me. So if I use it the same way he uses it, I get the same results as he did. Same thing, Right? Let me put it this way. I, you know, I've laid it down. I used to be fairly good with a, with, a, with a guitar. My fingers no longer love it. At one time, I had a callus on every finger, big, hard callus, because I played it in every service. So I developed calluses on my fingers. And then I could, you, we could put a blindfold on and still pl- play it, because I had it so much in my hand. I could play it. But now, when I play it, it goes... Brrr, because my fingers are not adjusted to it, used to it anymore. I can't mash them, the, the, the strings down correctly the way I used to. But at one time I could. But now it's a little bit rusty. Why would it be rusty? I haven't practiced it. If you don't practice your faith, guess what happens to it? It gets rusty. It gets rusty. And too many, too many people blame the pastor because your faith is rusty. I'm doing my best to teach you the Word of God. I'm doing everything that I know to tell you that you have as much faith as I do. You have as much faith as Jesus does. You're just not using it. Right. You've got to develop it. I could, you know, some of you that probably never had a guitar in your hand to do it, I could give it to you, and you wouldn't know what to do with it. I'd say, give me the key of D. You'd say, key of what? Uh-huh. Where's that key found? It's on the guitar or the piano. And for a while, when, when we was in the, the pizza building, we lost our piano player. But we had this nice grand, baby grand piano. I figured, you know something? I know the guitar. I know where C is. I know what it sounds like. I know where D is. I'm not F. And I'm, you know, all these in the A. And, the, you know, and I know where it's at. So I got up there and began to, I know where they're at on the piano. I began to do this. Look at them. And all of a sudden, okay, I can begin to put this together. It wasn't long. I could almost begin to play the piano for song service. Because I began to use my hand. Now, it's been since then, I, you know, I still have the ability to do it. But the memory has slipped from me where to put my fingers. Some of you have laid your faith down and you, the memory is there. But you're not practicing with your faith. If you use your faith every day, you get so used to it that it becomes automatic in your life. It just becomes automatic. The Bible says what sort of things you desire when you pray, believe you receive it, you've got it. It's yours. We've got the desires, but we're not extending our faith to receive what God says belongs to me. 
It's mine. It belongs to me. God gave it to me. See, Jesus didn't pay for your healing just to be doing something, you know, let, let those people beat him on his back just to be beating him. It's for your healing. He suffered way more than you'll ever suffer. The price that he paid to get your prosperity had to be awful. They had three-inch spikes that they put on top of his head, and they took it and began to work it till they actually shoved it into a skull. You know, how the, you know down beside the, the bones and the blood began to drip out to the very point that I know, I, you know, I think that I can imagine what took place. Because I came up on a wreck once when a lady's face hit the windshield of a car, and her face was just her eyes, it was totally covered with blood. She couldn't see anything. This is what Jesus was going through. He was going through this. He went through it just for you. He loves you so much, but he's asked you, just, why don't you use your faith? He says, come on, give me your faith. Yeah. Give me your faith. See, he can't do anything until you exercise your faith. Why? Because he put everything in that category. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's, that's your faith. God gave it to you. The moment you got saved, he said, to every man's been given the measure. He gave you a measure of it where you can receive him. So with that measure, you received him. And once you received him, now you have everything that he has. He, he doesn't withhold. He said, I've given you all things, really, to make your life better. He moved down to earth to move us to heaven. He didn't come here just to be coming. He moved us. He came down here to re, really to read, because the Bible says in Ephesians, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ right now. Christ means the anointed. So if I'm seated with Christ in the anointing, then where he is, I am. I said this once to a church guy in a different church, and he said, man, how you lie. So we take the Bible, and go, you read it then. You tell me what it says. Well, that's not so. That, last week I gave you statistics about how the church is. One I didn't give you is 1,000, I think it's 1,000 churches every month right now is closing its doors. 1,000 every month is closing its doors. That's how many pastors are walking out and saying, it's not worth it, just give it, give it up. I did that once. I never do that again. Amen. I went through hell because I walked away from God's calling. It's not, it's not fun. No. It's not fun to walk away from what, what he appointed unto you. Every one of us have a destiny on our life. On. We have a calling upon our life. Yes. And your calling is touching people's lives whether you know it or not. On. There's people watching you. Yes. There's people watching you. How can you cope with, with situations that's in your life? How do you cope with them? Yes. What happens when the pressure of life is up on your, up on your life? What are, you, what are you going to do with it? What do you do with it? Well, you take that pressure, you turn to God and say, God, mm -hmm. I know that you paid for all of this. See, if this is a physical thing, he paid for it. If it's a spiritual thing, that's inside, okay? Spiritual things, you know, he, he dealt with it. When the Father beat him, he literally took every sin that you committed, is committed, and will commit. You mean he forgot, he, he gave, forgave my sins even though I haven't committed them? He said, yeah. He said he can't do that. Don't tell me what he can't do when he already did it. <laughs> when did he forgive your sins? On the cross. When did you receive it? When you asked him to come into your heart. When you asked him to come in, what happened? All those sins were removed from your life. But yet we see them on our lives as now. They're not there now. Don't remind God of who you used to be. Come on. Don't remind him of who you used to be. Come on. Tell him of who you are now. Come on. Tell him. The Bible says, bring me in remembrance of my word. Yes. I paid for your forgiveness. I paid for your healing. I paid for your prosperity. I paid for their peace of mind. I paid every bit of that. And when I paid for it, there's only one thing missing. You won't take it. 
Yes. The Bible says, whatsoever, them, whatsoever thing you receive, believe, you receive them. That means believe, you take them. That you take them. Yes. How do I take it? You've got to get in the Word of God and cleanse this mind to quit believing the things of this world. That's why Jesus came, to, to, to flush out everything. One thing I want to talk to you about. Let me, let me get this thing in my hand. I want to talk to you about this. Whatsoever he saith unto me, here's what you've got to remember. Whatsoever he saith unto me, do it. You've got to come to that. See, a lot of people look at Jesus and say, well, he, he, was, he was God. That's why he was so perfect. That's half truth, not the whole truth. He walked as man, not as God. It was illegal for him to come as God on this earth. Yes. He had to come as man to pay, for, to pay for sin. He had to do it. He had to walk a sinless life to pay for your sins. He had to be beaten till there was nothing left to be beaten with. He beat the, really the flesh off his back. There was no stripes there. And if you actually study it out, it says by his stripes, it means by his bruises, by the beating of his back. There was nothing left there to have stripes on. That's what that he did. But now he's asking one thing. Whatsoever. Go, let me show you. Whatsoever. John 2, 1 to 5. John 2, 1 to 5. Listen, to, watch this. And the third day there was a marriage of Canaan and Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was calling the disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman? You know, I said that to a, to a person some years ago. I was working on a house. And, and I was beginning to talk about my wife. And I said, My woman said this. And, he said, and, the, and the lady said, You just degraded me. I said, You have a problem then. If woman degrades you, you have a problem. You need to improve yourself. Self, your self-image is too low. Too low. So I'm not going to go anymore. Okay, get out of there. <laughs> Jesus and her woman. How many, how many ladies did Jesus call woman on this earth? How many? How many? Can you count? How many? His mother and who else? The harlot. We call today, we call the whore. Call each one woman. What was the word woman? What did it mean in those days? That was the highest form of praise to a lady in that day, if you called her woman. That's what it meant. You couldn't get them any higher. You couldn't get them any higher. That's what that word meant. When they said woman, in other words, mama, I love you, but what's that to do with me? Now remember, up till this moment, Jesus hadn't done any miracles. He's waiting for the Father to talk. Till the Father talks, he can't talk. He said, Jesus and her woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. It hasn't been here yet. But notice what woman said, which is his mother. His mother said unto him, unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you, what? Do, it. do what? Do it. Do it. Who saying to you, Jesus? But Jesus just said, my hour's not here. I can't do anything yet. But the moment, listen, listen, watch this, watch this. But the moment faith is released, God has to react to your faith. And with the moment he's, that he said, my hour's come, she didn't even consider that. Not a bit. Why? Because the Bible said, if you really study the life of his mother... She, the Bible says she watched him closely, everything he did. And she noticed when she gave this boy a commandment, he was obedient. How would you like that with your kids? Have you got one of those? Have you got, did you raise one of those that you said something to every time they did it to the letter? They did everything to the letter? You said something? Boy, they did, did it. Take out the trash. Okay. Boom. Water the front yard. Okay. I got, I got you. I got you covered. Hey, today we got excuses. I got homework. I don't have time. I got to do this. I got to do that. Why? We got all these excuses. But mama, watch this boy closely. She turned, didn't talk to him no more. She turned to the disciples. 
and said, whatever he says now, I want you to do it. Then, then, this, then this is what he said. Look, watch this. Keep rolling the tape. Okay. There, and there was six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firskings apiece. You know how much, you know how much water that is? You study that, how much water that is? I went to the lowest denominator. The lowest denominator would be 120 gallons. So is this a small, small wedding? I began to ask myself, 120 gallons of water or wine is not a small wedding. It's a big wedding, right? So Jesus said, so there are some two and some three. So I put it all in the two categories, which made 120 gallons. So we had probably up to 150 gallons of water. They had to go out and fetch and bring in. How many, how many of those people were complaining, do you think? It's a wonder if we don't get some writings of Peter. Said, what did you say? 150 gallons, we got to go out and fill these things and bring them in? Here's what took place. You know. And I asked, so I began to ask the question. Whatever he saith unto you, do it. Whatever he say, and I begin to see a pattern that when Jesus did things on this earth, and when he said something, then what, what reflected upon the person, will they, will they uh, uh, obey the, his word? And the moment they obey, now faith is reacted. And when faith is reacted upon, faith now will give you what it says. So I begin to look at it. John 9, 1 to 11. I want to ask you a question. How would this be? I'm going to show you. I mean, I'm going to show you today. If this happened today in this church, <laughs> I thought about it. I said, dear God, I'd empty a church. They wouldn't be back. If I did this, they'd leave. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was, which was blind from his, from the, from his birth. Now we're going to go for a while, guy. We're going all the way to 11. And his disciples asked him, said, Master, who did sin? Okay, see, they're, they're automatically. How come, how come you're going through some bad things? Who did sin? What's in your, how come all these things have happened? Did you sin? Well, one sin that you have to be accountable to. Did you obey God or did you not obey God? Just because you obey God doesn't mean you're going to walk through this life unhindered, unchecked. Didn't the Bible say, though I fall, I what? But the first thing it says, I'm going to fall once in a while. Things are going to happen. Yea, though I walk through, didn't say around, through the valley of shadow, I shall fear no evil. Now begin to look at this. And his disciples asked him, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents? He said, no, he was just born blind. That's the way it was. Keep going. They said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. And as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. He turned that job over to us. We are the light of the world now. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Now my question is, <laughs> how much spit was that to make clay? Let's all go outside, and I'm going to spit on the ground, or you, and we're going to make us some clay. How much of us has got to get together to get enough spit together so we can make a hand some, some clay? I ain't got that much in my mouth. But if I fill it full of water, I can blow it out. But here he said, he spit on the ground and made clay. Now, what's he going to do with this clay? And one word came out to me. And I asked God about this one word. I want to know, how come you put this word in there? And when he had spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he, what? Anointed. What? Anointed. He did what? That looked like mud to me. 
Now, I, you know, it, I had, you know, I've had this thing figured out in my own mind a long time ago. Because, because you know, uh, Genesis, I think it's like 2, 7, 2, 8. God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He formed him yes. out of the dirt. Yes. And this boy was born blind, right? So apparently something was missing when he was born. That's why he couldn't see. So since he was made from dirt, my mind says, God put, Jesus put dirt in there to finish what wasn't done. That's how I had to figure it out. But God says, that's only partially right. The greatest one was when he put the word in there, anointed. Come on. Anointing comes in when, listen to me, you're only anointed when God says something and you do it. See, anointing, listen, listen, listen. When God speaks to you personally and you do what he has said now that word is anointed in you to do it. And if you do it, whatever he says will happen. Because it's anointed. How do I know? Well, John 6, 63 tells me that. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So I'm speaking, when God says something, I'm speaking spirit, life into that, whatever it is. So I remember back when I was standing over a young lady, I told you about whose head went through the windshield of a car, and God said, pray, okay? Now, I don't have to do anything except do what he said. I can't heal. I can't stop the blood. See, I already, see, I already know what's taking place. There's like, let me go back, because this has been over 20 years. If I go back, I think it's three guys. They, they, were, they were getting rags, wiped, putting it around her head, trying to do their best to, to press it, to stop the bleeding. But the more they put on, it just kept coming through them, kept coming through them. And the Lord said, pray for her. I thought, <laughs> I've never done this before. When you step out on the grounds that you've never done, you've got questions with the inside of you. God, are you sure you want me to pray for them? I thought, what's it going to hurt? They're not doing any good. I'll just do what he said. Then the moment I asked, I said, young lady, do you mind if I pray for you? The moment I said that, those three guys got up and ran. Now it's up to me. What am I going to do? I'm by myself. They couldn't stop it. I know I can't stop it. But the moment I put my hands on her head, the Bible said, lay hands on the sick and they... When I, was, when I heard that word, which is anointed... All I got to do is what the Word said, and the anointing has to do what it said. That's what was taking place here. The anointing takes over when I do what it said to do. The anointing takes over. And if you never do it, even though it's being spoken to, it's not going to come to pass. He said, when he's spoken, you know, when he took it... He took, them, he took it, made a ball out of it, and put it on the eyes. And then he said this to the man, anointed eyes. He said, anointed eyes of the blind that he could, that with clay that he could see. But he couldn't see yet. What about the next verse? And it said to him, go wash. Okay, now, something that he has to do after the word's been spoken. You get this? Something that he has to do once it's been spoken. The spoken word by itself is anointed. But until you follow it through, nothing will happen. You've got to walk it out. Yeah. Once you walk it out, then something's going to take place. He said, go, he said, go wash him. He said, and he went his way, therefore, and wash came seen. Wait a minute. It don't make sense. You put mud on my eyes. Now I go wash it off. Now I can see. God's doesn't make sense. Most of the times. But he makes miracles when you listen. Miracles begin to happen when you listen to God. Now, listen, watch this. Too many people come up with this idea. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Maybe you are. But you better make sure you're hearing from God. 
We better make sure that you're hearing God. See, I can take this Word of God, and I can quote the Word of God to you, but do I really believe what the Word says? Because the Bible said, faith cometh by So if I just take it one time and never hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it, that means continue hearing till I literally flush out the junk that's in my body, my mind I'm talking about, that my mind's got to be cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. I've got to literally cleanse my mind till I believe the word greater than I believe whatever is against me. That has to be more important, the word. Now, in the middle of your situation, what are you talking about? Yeah. How, do you, how do you explain what you're in? How do you explain the valley you're in? How do you explain the mountaintop I would like to be on? But what, what happens is too many people talk about their problem, the mountain, and never talk about the answer. That's right. And so as long as you talk the problem, you'll live the problem. But when I, because you will be criticized highly. When you begin to call yourself healed, when you're sick. Yes. If you don't believe it, try it. <laughs> Most people around me now already know. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you're, you're the heel. I said, that is correct. Come on. That is correct. I am the heel. I'm going to walk the heel. I'm going to talk the heel. Yes. What if you get sick? I don't go with the what if. I just go on the word. Come on. I want the anointed word coming out to my mouth. To the very point that it does exactly what it said it'll do. And I begin to see this. That he had to do his part after Jesus did his part. Once he was anointed, now there's something that he has to do. You see that? Watch this. Let me ask you the questions. How many people did Jesus actually spit on while he was on this earth? You ever think about it? (laughs) <laughs> well, I did. I, I want to know. Yeah. Go to Mark seven thirty three. I want to know. Jesus gets in a, in a habit of spitting on people. Mm-hmm. Every time he spit, something seemed to work. Now, if, like I said, if I try this, you, most of your people, if you came up here for prayer, whatever's your problem, I want to spit on it. You said, you forget it, you know. <laughs> forget it. Yeah, we ain't going that way. I mean, God would have to twist my arm and everything else to make me spit on you. I mean, that's not going to happen. But if he told me to, look out. Right. <laughs> look out. I'm going to go to spitting. Amen. Come on. Why? Because once you do what the Word says, yes. then whatever the Word says to do, something's going to happen. Yes. Let me tell you. Yes. Watch this. And it took him aside, this is the blind man again, and, to, and put his finger in his ears and he spit where? <laughs> on those fingers and <laughs> shoved them in his ears. Now, the Lord, that's a little bit nasty, for as I can say. A little bit, you know, what are you doing? He said, He took him aside from the multitude and put his finger in his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. Look at here. Come on. So he touched what we with? Spit. You want me to spit in your mouth? Ain't no way. But Jesus just all over his finger and shoved it in his mouth. Why would you do that? But if you keep reading, the Bible says his tongue immediately became loose and he began to, sp- he began to talk immediately and he could hear. Why? Because the anointed word. Now listen. Jesus only did what the Father told him to do. And he's going to be doing today, he's going, to, he's going to do miraculous healings, but a lot of them, we won't understand them. We don't say, God, why are you doing it this way? You don't have to understand it, you have to obey. The first commandment for a miracle is, did you do what he said to do? That's the first commandment. Did you do what he said to do? If he didn't do it, then don't expect a miracle from God. Did you do what he said to do? Let's follow this a little bit more. A, Mark 8, 22 to 25. Mark 8, 22 to 25. See, Jesus used this method more than one time. He used it. And he, and he cometh to Bethsaida, and, he, and they bring a blind man unto him 
to be, and he besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hands and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes, what? I mean, how would you like it, you know? I could walk up to you and go, just fill your eyes full of spit. That ain't going to go over very good. But it will if your eyes are open to see. Yes. Yes. Miracles, when miracles begin to happen, no matter what way or what method God uses, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a church and throw it into the second realm that you've never been into. Yes. That's where the church is headed for. I'm, I'm seeing the church more spiritual next year than ever before. I'm not concerned about the growth. I'm concerned about your spiritual walk in God. Yes. Growth will come when spiritual work, when the spiritual inside of you begins to, begins to take off, then everything else will just go with it. I want you, you know, and here's what I'm hearing God say. The church must come to a point that it's time for the church to grow up and begin to realize and quit making mistakes and hide them from somebody else. Yes. You hide them from you. You put them in a, you put them in a closet. Boom. Nobody knows. Yeah. Let me put it the way Creflo Dollar says. Everybody in here has issues. Everybody has issues. Everybody, not some. Everybody. Everybody. So if your issue is bigger than mine, what made it bigger? You may be a thief. I may be a, a killer. Which one's bigger? Which one's bigger? Neither one. There's only one thing God's going to judge you on when you get sent for him. Unbelief. Not what you did. It's beyond belief what you didn't believe. Amen. That's where you're going, to stand, you're going to stand in judgment with him. He's going, to, he's going to stand there and say, how come you didn't believe me? Come how come you didn't go with me when I said this? How come you didn't do it? Unbelief. He's going to judge the world of unbelief. He said, he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of town, and when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on his eyes and he asked him this question. Can you see? And here's what he said. I see men as trees walking out here. Now, I want you to know one thing. When faith starts, don't give up on it. Come on. God, see, Jesus didn't give up on his faith. He said, I see man as trees, but he put his hands once again back there. Then he said, now what do you see? I see men clearly the way I'm supposed to see them. See, many times we get in God's face and we get half the miracle. You stay there believing God until you get the full miracle. You stay there. You stay there. You stay there. You stay there. Now watch this. Here's the reason we want anointing. Everybody knows this in Isaiah 10, 27. Isaiah 10, 27. We need anointing in this life. We need it. We've got to have it. If we don't have anointing, we have nothing. Without the anointing, nothing happens. Why? And it shall come to pass in that day that the burden shall be taken off of thy shoulder and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The yoke shall be destroyed. He didn't say he's just going to tear it down. Do a little bit with it. He said, I'm going to destroy this yoke. In other words, if I'm going to destroy it, it's, not, it's going to be gone totally. It's, it's right. Then I begin to see this in Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, who went about, am I going too fast for you? Who went about doing good, healing how much? Healing how much? Well, I can tell you right now, he didn't heal everybody. He didn't. Didn't he not say when he came to some of Jerusalem, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I gather you together as a hymn would gather you? But you would not. And I couldn't heal very many people here except because of your unbelief. unbelief. Everybody that believes, he cured all. Everybody that believed, he cured all. All got healed. All got delivered. Well, how did he do it? The believers. Yes. The believers receive. The believers receive. Condemnation is, never, is not there. So we condemn ourselves because once in a while. Everybody knows John 3, 16, don't we? For God, come on, tell me, that he 
gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not, but have what? Now give me verse 17. You don't know it, huh? How, what did you quit for? Huh? Start it off. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. saved. He didn't send a son to condemn the world. So if he didn't condemn us, who's doing the condemning? See, we condemn ourselves more than the devil condemns us. The devil will bring up your past. Well, the devil will tell you about your, what, your, your mistakes. Then all of a sudden we begin to condemn ourselves. He's surely a guy that he's always there. He's telling you about how no good you are, what you have done wrong. And all of a sudden you begin to condemn yourself. Yeah, I know I'm a dirty, rotten rat. You know, and you begin to go through all these things. Instead of getting in front of your mirror and said, there is therefore now no condemnation. In other words, see, you got to get out of yourself. you got to get into him. And get your eyes off of the mistakes of other people and get them on yourself. Yeah. When you get them there, remind yourself, but the blood covered it. Yeah. The blood erased it. The blood took it out of my life. Instead of allowing the devil to, to, to convince you that you're no good, that you, you can't be anything. Here's what the word says. When they brought the lady that was caught in the, in the, in the, in the act of adultery, in the very act, he said, in the very, in other words, they jerked her out of bed, took her to Jesus, threw him in front of him. What did Jesus reply? What was his reply? He wrote first. What was he writing? We don't know. We can sort of assume. Maybe he was writing names. Maybe he was writing sins. He was writing something. But then he said this, you that were out, sin. Okay, go ahead, throw. Go ahead. Go ahead. Every one of them had a rock in their hand. That's why he said it. Every one of them had a rock. And the Bible says they dropped them one by one from the oldest to the least, and I had to walk out. Why? There's nobody in the church or in the world that is perfect that we have the right to point fingers at somebody and say, you're not worthy. Amen. We can't do it. Yeah. We can't do it. Yeah. I am worthy because of him, not because of what I did. I'm worthy because of what he paid for, not because of what I did. He made me worthy because of what he did. The Old Testament, I had to work for my salvation. The New Testament, he worked it all. All I got to do is receive it and believe it. Receive it and believe it. Second Corinthians 4, is it? No, it's uh, 4.13? I think so. We have him the same spirit of faith. According to that, it is written, David said this, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also believe, therefore we speak. I have the same spirit of faith as he does. How come I can see your problems bigger than mine? Because that's the way we are. We got to stay in the love of God so much. But God has forgiven me. God has forgiven you. I don't have a right. If anybody had a right to point fingers, it was Jesus. But Jesus, he has a right to point fingers. He had the right. Now, I want, I want, you know, I got to hurry. I got to get through this. We've, 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 we've talked about this, but there's one thing I want you to see. John 21, 1 to 6. What? All right. Hang on. We'll do that next week. Go to Luke 5, 1 to 5. We've went over this one uh, quite, quite a bit. But I want you to see something. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two ships docked by the lake. But the fishermen, that's the disciples, were going out of them and were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed, or he said unto him, he said, thrust out a little bit from the land, and he sat down and began to teach. 
Keep going. Now, when he had finished, because he left off, he said, when he had finished teaching, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep. I thought I pretty well covered this in a few weeks ago because we went probably through a few, two or three weeks on this one thing. But something I have missed. Maybe you've seen it. I haven't. But I have this week. Launch out in the deep. Let down your nets, plural, not singular, for, for a catch. Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled or we have worked all night long. Have caught in nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And I've thought about this. Later, later you find Peter, which we've gone over this, later you find Peter, after they have caught all those fish, he came and dropped down in front of Jesus and began to repent of his unbelief. I believe that's what it was. Just re- begin to repent because of all the things that Jesus said to him. Everything that he said, once he did it, it came to pass. Now I want you to see, there's two people here that are exercising faith. Jesus said, let down your nets, plural, for a catch. He released his faith for two nets full. And he spoke to the fish to come and fill up two nets full. Peter said, I've worked all night long. Peter, and all of a sudden I said, he, said, he said, son, look at this. Peter did not have enough faith to let down two nets. He only had enough faith to let down one. And he said, nevertheless, at thy word, in other words, he said he was doing this through obedience more than the faith that he had. He didn't have the faith to put him down. Because he already showed you his faith. I worked and I'm tired. I don't want to do it. But nevertheless, at your word, I will, I will do something to show you that I got some faith. He let down one net. It's too many times you criticize yourself because you, you only did half of what God said. And you got lit, and, and all of a sudden, all these things come in because you extended your faith as far as you can extend it. And God bless you to the fullest, not just to your faith. That's what happens when you turn loose of your faith. And God said to do all of this, you don't have enough faith to do it. But if you'll just do what God said, God will still give it to you. Amen. He'll still give it to you. Amen. He'll still bring it to you. Why? Because he said, all you got to do, exercise what faith you got, and I'll finish it for you. Because, because he, he explained this way. All you need is faith as the size of a grain of a mustard seed. That you can say in this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart. But believe those things which you say have to come to pass. You shall have whatsoever you say. Why? Because, see, once you exercise faith, God will really replenish everything and give it all back that the devil's stolen. He'll bring it back. But too many people are not exercising the faith that you have. You think, until I get it, this big faith that he said, I'm not going to do anything. Don't wait on all that faith. Get it going now. Begin to exercise your faith now. Let it go now. Because now, now is when God wants it. Or he would have never said, it's what I want you to have. Release. Release what you've got. Release what you have. If you release it, I'll finish it. Because the Bible said he is the finisher of your faith. See Hebrews. He's the finisher. I want him on my side finishing what I can't believe for. But if I'll exercise what I've got, he will finish what I started. Can you see this?